Cybersecurity training is a vital uh, piece in every organization. Doesn't matter if you are one person or 2.5 million users like Walmart. Like you need to get ongoing training about cybersecurity. Welcome back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. My name is Victoria Dickerson, and I'm joined by my fellow Startup Junkie co-host, Jeff Amarin. How are you? I'm great. Glad to be here. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. And Harrison Kitson, how are you? Wonderful Thursday morning. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, today we're excited to be joined by Eyal Galico. He's the founder of Apollo IT Services, a company that specializes in IT and cybersecurity help. Galico, how are you today? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for being on our show. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're a, a pro now. It's like your third podcast appearance in two weeks. Something like that, yes. Yeah, season pro. <laughs> awesome. So how we kind of get the Startup Junkies show started is we ask the founders your story, your genesis. You can go back as far as you want to um, how you started Apollo IT or even got the idea to start it. So if you can go back in time, tell us about your genesis. Okay. Um, so as you can hear from my accent... Right. I bought it at Walmart. Uh, yeah, I came with a pound of pickles. Um, moved here from Israel 15 years ago. Um, I came to work for one of the Apple computer subsidiaries. Worked in a small city in Texas called College Station. Moved to Austin after a while. Worked for a bunch of um, IT companies, medical software companies. And at some point, I'm like, I was not making the money I want, and I was not having fun. And... Having fun is a big deal when you want to work uh, for a long time. So I decided to start my own company, sit down for three, four months, did my business plan that absolutely went out the window after six months, was absolutely rubbish. Uh, but it's a good start to give you a think, think about what you want to do and just start working from there. I have a networking event, uh, meeting people, spreading the word. And it's been, October is going to be nine years. Nine years with Apollo IT or since you came to Northwest? No, no, when no. did you come to Northwest Arkansas? So actually I moved here, uh, May is going to be two years, so like two years ago. Okay. Cool. Uh, nine years uh, since I founded Apollo IT. Been here for almost two years, absolutely love it. Not going back to Austin, absolutely not. <laughs> this you... was an upgrade, right? <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about your story with Apollo IT specifically, kind of how that process of building that company has been? Um, when I started the company, uh, I was one of the top tier advisors for Apple computers, uh, Mac OS. So we were registered with Apple. We got a lot of referral from Apple for servicing Apple computers. I think like 10 years ago, there was not a lot of people that service Apple computers. Mm -hmm. uh, we are like one of three only in Austin that are certified to work on Mac and troubleshoot problems. So it gives us a lot of visibility into clients, expand our business, um, but at some point, we learned that, uh, so our company name did not start as Apollo IT Service. It started as a Top Mac IT Solutions. And it was great for the first few years, but at some point, people thought like, oh, you do only Macintosh, Apple computers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, actually, that's not correct. We do probably 50-50. And then as the years go by, I'm like, okay, you do only Mac, you do only Mac. People didn't even realize that we were doing Windows computers or other stuff. So we had to rebrand to Apple IT services. And we're still doing Apple computers. We just, now it's a more generic name, I want to say, mm -hmm. call it. But this is pretty much, we started with small clients and then keep, people came to us. Hey, we need help with this. We need help with this. Here is a new thing in the industry. Can you help us with this? We need to help. We have more employees. We have this now cloud services. What's the best way to mitigate the risk? And then it just keep growing. And 2015, 16, no, I'm not to me, like 18, 19, when cybersecurity started to get like a real headwinds, mm -hmm. like uh, backwind, sorry. Okay, people are more aware of that, what's happening in the industry. And this is where we started to endeavor into the deeper side of cybersecurity and understanding the risk, uh, how to fight that, and learning more about cybersecurity. I'm curious what, my question was, whenever you started 15 years ago, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but what was the general idea about cybersecurity? Like what were the big threats at the time and what is it now? How has it changed AI and all of that conversation? Oh, that's a hot potato topic. I'm uh, sure it is. So, um, <laughs> 10 years ago, like if you think about it, like cyber crime was always maybe there just in a very, very, very like minuscule things. Like you really had to know how to hack into 
um, enterprise infrastructure. It was very, very hard. Now, with the abundance of internet and mobile devices came the accessibility of like other softwares. Mm -hmm. And I think around 2014, 15, when ransomware is like where software literally grab a hold of your files and then hold it for ransomware. And then you have to 72 hours to pay us usually in a Bitcoin because it's non-traceable. And then if not, we just we lose your data. So that's where the, the role started to come up and it just become like a very, very, very profitable industry for hackers. I think the FBI said it in 2022 that cybercrime now generate more revenue than organized crime. Oh my gosh. Wow. Think about it. It's like easy. You sit someone, send mm -hmm. the code 60,000 times a week, see who grabs it, and 70% of businesses pay their ransomware because they don't have any other program, exit strategy, backup solutions. Mm -hmm. They pay the money. And this is and the, is it category? Is that the biggest threat that's out there? Um, <clears throat> that's one of them. There is yeah. also um, still of proprietary information, depending mm -hmm. what you do, mm -hmm. um, disturbance of infrastructure, uh, colonial pipeline, took down the pump for Texas, yeah. right? That's yeah. a big one. Um, the Garmin hack happened three years ago. Uh, most people think it was, oh, my stop, my Garmin watch stopped working, but actually Garmin is the sole provider for a uh, flight map for the USA. So FAA <laughs> require you to update the map every 24 hours. It's definitely and, critical infrastructure. So it is. Yeah. So they paid the ransomware $10 million. Um, oh my gosh. And we just had like three weeks ago, US Healthcare, uh, United Healthcare. Uh, they had a huge breach. They paid $22 million. Mm. So it's just depending what they're looking for. If you have something valuable, the hackers will find a way in eventually. It's just a matter of time. Sometimes <clears> they <throat> sit down on your network for six months, nine months, just studying the infrastructure and finding mm -hmm. the loophole. Most of the times it will come from the human element. We are the weakest point. I know it sounds crazy, but we are the weakest point when it comes to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. We are very prone to say yes, give access, spit the password to someone that he calls, hey, we're calling from your help desk. Mm -hmm. Can you help me with this? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. And give it the that whole password. Phishing and social engineering it, part of it, it's right? It's still a big thing. Like yeah. Phishing, social engineering. So this is where AI uh, came into, I want to say, work against us. Uh, mm -hmm. So BEC, business email compromise, that's the term we use, is the phishing, right? The how to get people to react to something. In the past, you can see like the email was just bad spelling, bad grammar. Like you can definitely mm -hmm. tell it, right? The email was just mumbo jumbo of letters and numbers. Now what we see is like people use chat GPT, AI tools to write perfect emails, right? There is no mm -hmm. no mistakes, no spelling. And then in the past, they used to send you like, okay, here's an Excel file, click on that, get you infected. Now they use legit 365 or uh, Google accounts, you put a link to a file that when you click on that, it takes you to the online, then you get infected. Mm -hmm. But the email and the links are all kosher. So it will literally slide through all the filters you have in your wow. system and it just goes through. Um, something that we just saw um, happen to one of our clients. Uh, our CEO got an email working with a, they are a startup company trying to raise money. And CEO is like working with a, another accountant to help raise money. Someone spoofed the accountant email, literally grabbed the whole correspondence of the email, mm. the whole correspondence, and just pasted it into a spoof email. It was just a few letters different. But the owner of the company got the email, and I'm like, he looks at the correspondence. It looks identical. The signatures, the email, his email back and forth. The only thing that they changes time is like they change the PDF that has the wiring information. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the CFO lady is like, hey, the number we have on file is not the same one for this account. Jeez. And we started to investigate and we found out like it came from a wrong email and everything. But the email was very, very similar. But someone managed to get the correspondence. So it just looks so legit and it's very, very hard to detect. Um, mm -hmm. So it's absolutely out there right now. AI is against us. I know it sounds funny, mm -hmm. but it's not. We are losing the battle against AI for now. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of preventative things in the works to, to battle that or any things that people can do right now to kind of prevent that? You can put your computer in a Faraday cage and this will be perfect. But no. Um, <laughs> it could work. I, I need that to yeah. work today. <laughs> so but. it's a lot about employee awareness. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. uh, cybersecurity training is a vital 
uh, piece in every organization. Doesn't matter if you are one person or 2.5 million users like Walmart. Mm-hmm. Like you need to get ongoing training about cybersecurity, what threats are currently on the market or in the spectrum, how to identify them, what to look out for, especially how to identify malicious email, hover links, check the spelling of the, the email itself. Like, does it look suspicious? Does it look very similar? Uh, what is like reverse social engineering? Like someone calls you from your help desk. Like, it is, mm-hmm. is it your real help desk? Um, make sure that no one is uh, surfing over your shoulder, like trying to peek over your stuff. Mm-hmm. Or when you walk into a building, like someone not trying to squeeze behind you and like walk into the door. It's a security, physical security. When you send information, like when you send financial information or PII, personal identifying information, make sure you encrypt your email. There's mm-hmm. different ways to secure your day-to-day operation, depending on your industry and your regulations. FDIC, HIPAA, government, just everyone has different requirements that you have to be aware. And the more people are know about it and know what's the risk and the damage it can happen to the mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. And I so said, this is people don't understand is like, we just hear the big stories, but it affects small businesses a lot. But, oh, we just hear this thing, but you never know the story behind it or what's happened to the business after mm-hmm. that. The moment you expose your employees to like, hey, this is what can actually can happen to us, they, they have more personal connection to the damage that can happen mm-hmm. and then they are more prone to be aware of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of companies we see now using a um, three strike method, uh, like it needs to come from management down, but you take a cybersecurity training and the next thing like if, then the IT usually go send phishing emails and try to fish you and then mm-hmm. if you click on that, First time, you're going to take the cybersecurity training again. Second time, you're going to have a nice uh, call with your manager. Third time, out the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, we heard stories that companies is like, there are a few hundred employees. It's like, if we're going down by a ransomware attack, it's going to cost the company $50 million yeah. a day. Yeah. said, no employee worth that money. Mm. So it's very, it's hard. It's harsh, absolutely. But the employee needs to know the risk. Like if you bring something bad into your company or you lose information, the company can go down the worst case scenario or lose a lot of uh, valuable information. Mm-hmm. You know, the mix of services that you offer, it's, do you do, you have like managed services and you yes. do penetration testing and some white do. hat yeah. hacking and, and whatnot? So we are a managed service provider. We provide pretty much, I want to say we become your IT and you're from mm-hmm. like the basic computer management, patching, software updates, third party software. Mm-hmm. Uh, servers, local or on the cloud, a lot of uh, cloud services, if it's email services, uh, spinning virtual machines, a lot of backup solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do also what we call BCDR, like a backup uh, business continuity disaster recovery. How do you protect your business in case your business goes down by ransomware, by building got hit by lightning? Mm-hmm. Happened to one of my clients one time. Interesting site, like again, seeing charred cords on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. But how fast you can recover from an attack. That's mm-hmm. one of key for Edelment and do a lot of testing and, of course, employee training. We manage most of the services. We do employ uh, third-party companies for our pen testing. Mm-hmm. So we want to be like a non-biased party. So we ask them to run that and then we get the result and sit with our clients. I'm like, here's what we found. Here's what we need to work. There's some procedures, policies. Again, depending on the industry, the executives needs to be able on board with that. It's a lot of nitty gritty that sometimes executives not always want to mm-hmm. do because it's a lot of head work. Like, mm-hmm. well, they have to do a lot. We give them a lot of homework to do and not happy about it. Nobody likes homework, right? So, but the moment the company is on board, it helps mitigate and minimize the risk drastically mm-hmm. um, to the company. We had a couple of re- uh, white paper research we read from other vendors that companies that force the employee on training, continuing education and telling the stories and and segregating the duties, managed to get the number of attacks from 60% to around 20% mm-hmm. on, on a business. That's huge mm-hmm. reduction. And did you also would you also recommend uh, cybersecurity insurance as well as a backup? Absolutely. That's something now we require all our clients to have. Mm-hmm. We have one for ourselves that is different from a client because mm-hmm. we do hold the keys to the kingdom, right. unfortunately for mm-hmm. us in this case, but we ask all our clients to have cybersecurity insurance. like. This thing, and we've seen, it, we've seen it live, it can be the, literally and figuratively, the only thing that will save your business if you get a breach or mm-hmm. cyber crime. Mm-hmm. It will pay for forensic analysis if you need to. That's something that most companies don't think about. 
uh, downtime for your employees and some recovery cost for like operations, stuff like that. But people are not aware that when you get hit by cyber crime, it's a data breach or ransomware recovery, even with you have all the tools is not fast. Right. right now, the average recovery time is three and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what you have. I mean, the best thing in the world, it's still going to take you a long time to recover from a, a like a ransomware attack. Mm -hmm. There is no way around. You just literally wipe all your infrastructure and start like a blank slate. Mm -hmm. it takes time to recover everything. And that's three and a half weeks without business. Oh, no, you're down. Yeah. Yeah. As much as I would love the vacation, <laughs> I don't think that Jeff would appreciate it quite as much, if I'm being honest. No. No, probably <laughs> no, not. It's, it's, it sounds pretty existential. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. sounds Maybe like a bad that joke, threat. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's like a lot of businesses think they are ready and prepared and, oh, we have their, we can be down for a week and stuff like that. But when it actually hits, people don't understand how complex the system mm -hmm. is. Like we are used to live around our cell phones, computers. We expect it mm -hmm. to work 24 seven, no problems. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Until it doesn't. Right. And then, oh, can, can like, oh, it's going to take you an hour to fix it. I'm like, no, it's not. This mm -hmm. is your like, hey, we have a problem. Like Houston, we have a problem. This is like the whole site is down. Like you need to fix the network, the servers. That's hours and hours, weeks to recover a full blown system. Yeah, we were hearing a story recently. It was a, medical supplier and i'll to avoid being sued i won't say who it was but they, <clears throat> they had to revert to taking orders over the phone with pen and paper they were completely yeah. out mm -hmm. there, none yeah. of their digital systems work in fact it was so bad they couldn't even take payment yep. from their customers they were a, completely idled we have a similar story from our cybersecurity uh, insurance lady in austin um one of our clients 18 users got hacked one day, got a ransomware request, they have in cyber insurance, they call them. Thankfully, they have a forensic analysis. That's usually when they try to backtrack, see where it happens. Mm -hmm. So she told me the story, this, their cyber, the forensic company just walked into the office, literally grabbed everybody's cell phone, tablet, computers, laptop, desktop servers, cleaned them out. The business owner was completely shocked. They left them with nothing, like even cell phones. He literally had to go to Best Buy, buy three computers so he can keep working somehow. Mm -hmm. Took them two weeks to find the, the bridge. Came from a suspicious email that one of the employees clicked, of course. Brought everything back. Then IT spent another two weeks to restore everything. Mm -hmm. The business owner was out for almost a month. Even though it managed to work somehow, most of the employees could not work. Uh, the cyber insurance paid for some of the lost revenue, but he said I was still out for a million and a half a week of going to conduct business wow. normally. And that's a real life story. And I can tell like we, me specifically, like a few months after I moved to Bentonville, I was asked by one a local lawyer here, a law firm here, to consult in a legal case that a contractor was building a store to a business owner in Bentonville. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like the last phases of the build out. The contractor got hacked, um, sent an email request to pay the last payment, $90,000 for the business owner. Seems legit. He paid $90,000. A few days later, the contractor is like, where's the money? We didn't get it. It was a hack. Mm. Oh, uh, they didn't have cyber security insurance. We went through a lot of legal stuff. They were absolutely lacking in, in security. And they couldn't even pay for for analysis. It was for this company size, it was over two hundred thousand dollars. It it's a lose lose for both cases. Like wow. they need to come to an agreement, but the contractor was absolutely didn't get the money. The business owner could not get an another contractor because this is like the last phase of the build out. He just lost $90,000 <laughs> on a brand new store. Man. So cyber insurance sometimes can literally save your business. Wow. Wow. Well, you've so, been at this a while. You built you built a company. What's the total yeah. team size now? How big uh, right now we are two. Uh, third one, hopefully in the next week. So I'm currently in the process of interviewing Got another uh, person for actually NWA. So when you when you do you do you use contractors or 1099s? Yeah, a when lot. you need to. Well, so you've kept the core team yeah. small. I gotcha. So we had actually a bunch of technicians that um, COVID was good and bad for us, I want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we hired a lot of people like W2s. And mm -hmm. then like the first few months of COVID was like absolutely amazing. And then mm -hmm. everything just crashed. We worked mm -hmm. with businesses mainly. And then like everybody's quiet, crickets, right? So we had to let go of a few of our technicians. And then I learned, okay, maybe move to con uh, 1099 contractors and then we now outsource a lot of our services. If it's helpless services, our pen testing team, 
this is expensive people, mm-hmm. like sure. network engineers. We just hire them based on projects. So we get a higher skill people. Yes, we pay more per one time, but you give me the chance to utilize a lot of advanced skills, something that I cannot afford to pay as a business mm-hmm. owner out of the gate, and then just get a better service for the project we are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to give an example, um, so in IT, we have like tier one, two, three, and four. Tier one is the sure. basic technicians. Mm-hmm. Um, Right now, we just read an article that the average salary in the USA for them is like now around, around 40,000. In Austin, we paid 65 for a tier one technician. This is a basic tech. Wow. When it's tier three or four, you're looking at like 150, 120 to 180, 200 a year, depending on the city. So mm-hmm. it's expensive to hire IT sure. people. They are in high demand. Everybody wants them like full time, hard to find people part time. And that's bring me to the other case is like, you want to maybe ask me, about how do I hire? IT people, everybody's like, oh, I need a degree. I'm like, you're going to hate it. But I say, no, we hire for experience. Yeah. And that's a big thing. And you see it a lot now in the in the industry. And there is a lot of... Um, what you know how to do versus mm-hmm. what the parchment says. I interviewed a, a lot of people that have a lot of certificates, right? right? They show me that they can study. And it took a lot of them myself. I can tell you a lot of them are <clears throat> nonsense. <laughs> just, just read and memorize the stuff. Hmm. Then you ask them about, okay, let's do a real life test. And then you see like, like a, look at you like a cow eyes. I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and that's the thing. So if someone asks me, okay, I have a degree, a certificate, experience, experience is number one. So far, all the hires we had in the past years, all of them were like people with no degrees, mm-hmm. excellent experience. I met a guy, barely finished high school. I was like, okay, let me, the guy was a maven when it comes to IT. He mm-hmm. can think outside the box, analyze scenarios, situations, find solutions that I'm like blown away. Mm. Barely finished high school. Mm-hmm. And I hired people that had degrees. Absolutely dumb tax. Pardon my language here, but <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I know that we're speaking at university here, but experience and some certification. And there is a guy that uh, it's called Chuck Network. He has a YouTube channel. He talks about five certification that you can do in a period of two years. It will take you from zero to two hundred thousand dollars a year salary, without a degree. Just start small, get your experience, and keep growing with that. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're looking to go into management, absolutely, you need a degree. Sure. Some of them are like the MBA, of course. Depending what your perspective in life, where you want to do, if you want to manage teams, and a lot of positions, like a lot of programmers, for example, what they study today, the computer science will not reflect on their real life mm-hmm. because most of the programming language today are like so fluid. Mm-hmm. I have a friend that is, a, she is a recruiter for a big company. She said more than half of our developers, people that came from boot camps, like six months to a year. Mm-hmm. And they are like showing better performance than people that had a degree. They just, they studied, yes, they don't study the whole history, but they don't need to. Mm-hmm. This is like old program, pro- program language. Nobody uses that anymore. They know the current one. They know how to use it and execute it. Mm. Something we have to train the, the new people with a degree. So there is some shift in the industry. We see it a lot now. People understand it's like degree. Again, people are going to bash on me here. It's vital for a lot of things. Like you cannot be a CPA or a doctor without a degree. Sure. But mm-hmm. a lot of technical stuff, hey, electricians, you'll be surprised how much they make without right. a degree. Right. I heard a story from a guy from the trade school in Waco, Texas, how much he makes out of the gate. And I'm like, that the moment I had like, I might be in the wrong career. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Absolutely, the skilled, the skilled yes. trades. And, and oh, you have the, no and, idea. And AI is not going to replace any of that, right? Oh, absolutely not. You're not, not going to get AI to do your plumbing, do your electrical work. Electricians, uh, HVACs, and welding. welders, yep. you won't believe. Yeah. yeah, It's a hard, tough job. But they make six figures out of the gate. Right. Think, 22-year-old kid makes six figures sure. out of the gate, and they can make over 200000 in less than five years later after some experience. Yeah. That's bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a job guaranteed for life. doesn't matter what you do. Half the world can collapse. You still need power, HVAC, right. and, right. and right. welders. So true. And it's just like, the guy told me the story, and I'm like, you know, I get my question marks popping in my head. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm the right <laughs> trade in this case. Yeah. So, how, yeah. did you, how did you decide on IT? Talk about those early formative years. Ooh. A lot of people wonder how, to, how, to get, how they got into STEM or how you get into IT services. What, uh, was, what was your early path? So I started... Uh, 20 something years ago, I studied graphic design for um, two, two years toward my degree. And it's like, I like uh, graphic design and animation. That's what brought me into this industry. So I studied that for two years, work, worked in a big 
PR firm. And I learned very quickly that I'm not creative. It just doesn't really mean I can do some stuff, but I cannot imagine stuff out of my head and just make it reality. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I was really good at fixing their systems over there all the time. So the first job gig I got is actually the IT company that worked for them. The lady over there, the my manager for that said, listen, he's a horrible graphic designer, but he's a great IT guy. <laughs> we should hire him. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what happened. He hired me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I came to them as a technician after a while. And this is how I started my, uh, my practice as an IT. I love the industry. Uh, got into working for big companies like Kodak, uh, Apple Computers, uh, subsidiaries. And you just, every time you go, you just learn something new. Mm-hmm. There's different challenges, different industries, different technologies. Things changes a lot. They moved to the cloud um, 10, 15, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, made a big change, you know, mm-hmm. in how you think about like hardware, software, what, what can you do? Like internet accessibility, cell phones, like people think about their cell phones as like extension of their office now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, right, the research that 36, 36% of businesses, small businesses, their cell phone is the only tool for them for to run their business. It's pretty wow. wild, right? It That's is. insane. In cybersecurity, when you look at the nature of the threats, and we've talked about various different ways that manifest, is a lot of it coming from nation states? Is it independent criminals? How, what's your view of that? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, out of the big ones you hear, I'm coming from nation states. Yeah. So we have Russia, North Korea, and China mm-hmm. are the biggest one. They have a dedicated teams for cybersecurity threats. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them is to harvest information. Uh, in case of China and North Korea, is just to steal plans for manufacturing. Like mm-hmm. China is very known for hacking uh, systems and stealing their blueprint. Mm-hmm. That's something big. A lot of it is just to collect information about people. A lot of it is hacking money, infrastructures, like pay us the ransomware. So it's, it's a big mm-hmm. payout for companies. It's a big thing for Russia, especially since the war with Ukraine. This is how they make money. They just literally, mm-hmm. people pay ransomware. Well, of it is just, USA is, I don't, sound, I don't know, it sounds bad, but it's wild, wild west when it comes to regulations about personal information, right? Mm-hmm. Contrary to the European un- Union that is more strict, USA is very loosey-goosey in this case. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because politics and capitalism makes its own way because we want to do this and it's how we go. And you can see example like TikTok, right? It's like mm-hmm. all over the news again. Yeah. So TikTok was banned from government employees a year ago, right? Now it's on the Senate to go for like full ban. Just to give you an example, if you read in the, when you install the app, there's something called the EULA, End User License Agreement. If you read down on that and see what kind of information access they want to, they literally want access to all your devices. Even if it's literally just for videos, they want access to your contact information, call log, files, access to your cloud accounts, mm-hmm. everything you have, the, your information. I'm like, why? And it was proven again and again that all this thing has been siphoned out For back sure. to China. Yeah. It's proven. There is no way around it. Yep. Like it it's, it's a fact now. This is why we tell employees, like, don't put TikTok. Like, don't use Timu or Shein. All these yeah. people love yep. it. Like, guess what? They sell you information. And mm-hmm. we can relate that. And mm-hmm. like you can see, like, you, you sign for a new website, the Chinese, and then somewhere your email just goes around in the dark web and just like spoofs somewhere. It's proven. Just be aware, be careful. Certain industries will just block it completely. Right? Yeah. If you care about your security and impeding your industry and business, right? Especially when it comes to high government or classified information, they lock down devices. You cannot do nothing. Yeah. And it makes sense. It makes sense yes. because they're playing the long game. Yeah. It's a thousand year strategy for them. And they're Machiavellian in terms of the way they approach it. It's uh it's pretty clear eyed. It's not like there's this sort of Western set of values they apply. It's all about winning the long game. It's right now just information and how you can harvest money from that. Mm -hmm. We just had a talk with Microsoft. We saw like a flow chart diagram, like of uh, how a cyber crime operation now works. Like, you know, it's like, it used to be like the mafia. You had the kingpin, that was like the name. And then you have a bunch of people, like a, we call it execution center, like Pakistan, Iran, India. They just, they develop the, the ransomware, the boot, and just send it to 60,000 people a week, just trying to see how it gets infected. And then you get there, usually it's a ransomware. And it shows a picture. There is a number, 1-800 number that you can call. They will, this 
call will write you to a call center in India. Mm-hmm. They will use your credit card, help you with your credit card, buy Bitcoin, print it ransomware, and then give you the decryption key. It's a fully organized mm. crime. And they made anywhere from eight to $15 million dollars per day. Wow. Just think how, and doing nothing, what? Sitting on their butt on a, on a yeah. chair and computer. Yeah. There's a great movie out. Well, I love Jason Statham, but there's a great movie out called The Beekeeper. I just saw it. <laughs> I'm like, man, and, and I wish it was in real life. And that, and, was, and that was kind of part of that story, right? Extremely well organized and multiple layers to get to the actual bad Scamming in USA is notorious, especially for older generation, older people. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of email from Amazon, Best Buy, your mm-hmm. insurance people call them. Here's a tip. Microsoft is never going to call you. Best Buy is not going to call you. No one needs access to your computer. It's like nothing. The IRS is not going to send you a text. Oh, <laughs> IRS never text you or call you like you need to pass right now. Like nobody needs a gift card from you. No one's going to send you to buy gift cards and send them in the mail. Yeah. No, just, just yeah. use some common sense. But sometimes when things happen, especially older people, and I can tell you like a personal story. It happened to my dad. Mm-hmm. My dad is deceased now, but a few years ago, he... I call him like, hey, dad, what's up? Oh, I'm on the, the way to the post office. You won't believe it. We got some money. This guy from Nigeria, like he said, that, like, I need to send him $10,000 and we're going to the heritage. And I'm like, we are white. We're nobody in Nigeria. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I said, tell, tell, reverse the story. Tell me what happened. Then, literally the Nigerian prince story. He fell for that. Oh, he was man. on the way to the post office yeah. to drop yeah. his, the rest of his retirement money. I'm like, dad, stop. Wow. Like, and he's like, he was 75. He's like, no, he got his, my email. Like he could, couldn't comprehend it. It's like email. He thought it's like, so personal that right. nobody knows it, but right. I'm like, they fish it. Yeah. And I tried to explain to him, like, don't give your email. And the way I put it to him and sounded as far as going to sound rude. I'm like, think about your underwear. You don't give your underwear to nobody. Right. That's pretty much how he explained like email. Yeah. Don't give it to anybody. Like, yeah. Don't give your underwear. You don't give your email to anybody. Yeah. yeah. But he was like a victim. I'm like, Thankfully, we caught it like literally like 20 minutes before you went to the post wow. office. Oh, no. But you have no idea how common this thing is. Yeah, yeah. There is rings of scammers around here that literally... You know, as you say that, I remember I got a call today about giving me tax help from some random number in California that I've yep. never contacted. I have not even Googled like tax help or anything, but today. And I saw that and I have enough awareness, like I've been in the digital world long enough that I'm aware that this is not anything that I need to call back or I'm interested in following up with. Like I just immediately deleted the voicemail. But today I got an email about some kind of, t- it wasn't from the IRS. Yeah. It was from somebody. Just- There's a lot of companies will quote unquote help you because yeah. during tax season, they will get your social security. And then, so what they'll do is actually they will funnel the refund back into their account. Mm-hmm. And then you didn't get it. And then, the IRS is like, okay, hey, you funnel money. So you get dinged twice. You lose their refund and then IRS uh, black mark you as like, okay, like a hostel entity or something like that. It's really, really bad. And mm-hmm. of course, in the moment they get the social security, you can you know, give your imagination wild rampant and like what can happen, like really bad stuff. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's identity theft is very common in USA also. Mm-hmm. And that's coming, like, yeah, that's coming from someone who has been long enough in this that I... I'm not an expert, but I'm at least aware of certain things, but it's just absolutely disgusting that they prey on older people who aren't as tech savvy, that that's their number one person they target. I've always been so worried about, like my grandma just loves to speak to absolutely everybody. everybody. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And she, she plays a game called, it's like a Scrabble game online. And she'll talk to people online, she'll meet them, and then she'll end up becoming best friends with them. Oh my. And I'm sat there thinking, who is this lady? Where have you met her? And then they've been best friends for five years and they've not, (laughs) <laughs> ever called each other and then it turns out it's actually a lovely lady from canada and she sends her bees through the post and they're actually best friends now that's crazy. so it, that it, may it, be the exception rather than the rule though. I, yes yeah, I, I i think don't follow you go in the same way that she might no but, um. <laughs> so here's an example right i mean you see it a lot there is always like a the current quote-unquote challenge right 20 questions about you what year we were born your school your dog name everything People are like, oh, here's my story. Here's what I do for a job. If you think about it, it's usually scammers yep. running like a scam behind the scenes. Like they collect information. So there's something that's called OSNET, open source information, right? Or it's open source intelligence. They can build a profile based on what they collect from you, from Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And then based on that, trying to deduce, okay, maybe he used that for his password and going to try to hack your bank account, social media. 
we see a lot of people lose their Facebook profile, right? It's very common, especially if you have a mm-hmm. business. We had a friend here. She's had her moving business. She lost her pro- business profile. It's been out active for 10 years, had thousands of reviews, feedbacks. Mm-hmm. She lost it because she used a very simple password for her Facebook account. And that's one of the tips we're going to talk later about. Some have some tips to give to our listeners. Yeah, let's, let's hear them. Okay. What, what are the um, tips? So probably the first thing we tell every, every company is like, use the password managers. So here's a fun fact for you. 93% of people use three password in nine different variations. Usually they just change the first or last or letters. Pretty much the same thing. Everybody. I tell people, everybody, you see like the fingers counting and everybody's like nodding. I'm like, yes, I've been there. <laughs> everybody. So that leads us to people use the same password for the banking, social media, business actions, other platforms. So when hacker gets access to the password, they get access to everything. Mm. So you want to separate that. So having a strong, using a password manager, you just need to remember one password to just open the vault and then let the password manager create this crazy, complicated password. I tell people, don't use any, anything less than 20 characters these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're mm-hmm. like banks allowed it, like online platforms, QuickBooks, Microsoft, they can go all the way to 50. Wow. Uh, yes, your Facebook password, need to be a strong one because you know why? It has all your life, your personal information. People put their phone number, date of birth, city they were born. If you have a business profile tied to that, you can lose pretty much everything on that. Mm-hmm. Banking, you should have a different password for every bank. Yes. For the IRA, Social Security, have a very, very strong password. You never give this password to anybody. Nobody going to call you. Never share this password with anybody. Period. Right? Make sure you have a strong password. Use Two-factor authentication, mm-hmm. absolutely a must these days, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a lot of them that offer that. It's annoying. Yes, I know. Nobody likes it. But guess what? If suddenly you get a pop-up on your phone, it's like, hey, like this is like someone is trying to access your account. Like, here's the code. And you didn't initiate that. You can hit no, and then they don't get access to the account. MFA or two-factor authentication, however you want to call it, can reduce the chance of hacking an account by 90%. Mm. Mm. It's a very simple, but a very strong tool. Mm-hmm. So have 2FA enabled and everything that you can enable. Another thing, have a proper backup. Doesn't matter what you have. You use Office 365 G Suite. We hear it all the time. Oh, I use the cloud, 365 or oh, Google. It's backed up. I'm like, no, it's not. Imagine you renting a computer from someone else. That doesn't, doesn't guarantee backup. And yes, you can get a ransomware on your email account and we'll encrypt everything. All your files, your OneDrive, your Google Drive, everything is busted. That's it. So make sure you have a proper backup for your computers, your laptops, your data, servers, of course, and make sure that one of these backup is outside the vicinity of your business. If your business get fired, ransacked, something, you want to make sure that it's like you have a copy outside the business. Mm-hmm. It can be on the cloud, it can be in another place in your home, doesn't matter. Put it in a, if it's a flash drive, put it in a, in a bank, in a vault. Have a backup. And most importantly, test this backup. We had clients that had backups for years and years and like eventually like, okay, we need to test this thing. This is not feasible anymore. Like, and then the backups are corrupted. You need to do a backup test every three to six months. Make sure they are still working. They can access them. How do you secure a backup? Encrypt the transmit of the information in and out of your business if you can. Google, Microsoft does offer email encryption. So if you send vital information out, uh, confidential, PII, whatever is critical for your business, use the built-in encryption. Have that. And last thing, be aware, right? People will reach out to you. Watch out for emails, phone calls. Mm-hmm. Just open your eyes. Use common sense. If you're not sure, hit the no first and then ask the questions. Not hit yes and then ask the questions. If you hit the yes, you're already gone, right? Mm-hmm. Just read and educate your employees about cybersecurity training. It can be a vital key to protect your business. Mm-hmm. Get cybersecurity insurance, of course. Have a proper procedures and policies. What you give access to whom? We see a lot of, a lot of small businesses. It's I said, probably almost 100%. People that are less than five employees. Oh, I have a new employee. Okay, let's give him access pretty much to everything. So suddenly you have access to HR, finance. I'm like, nope, you don't. You don't give this to anybody. He's your marketing person. He gets access to marketing material only. Doesn't need access to finance or HR. Mm-hmm. If you have a patent, confidential information, you don't need to share this information with them. Just segregate duties to whoever gets what. If you lay off someone, 
you immediately close the account, right? Make sure that you have these proper procedures. If you leave, if you let your employees bring your, their own cell phones to the business, have a policy what is allowed, not allowed. Can they like market your business? They can post on social media, right? What kind of social media posts are allowed? Heck, we had a client a long time ago, one of the employees worked in a computer store, came drunk to the work that day. It was like Monday after the weekend. If like he's put on Facebook, like I'm so wasted here at the work, I'm like, I'm barely holding myself. <laughs> Good this is not a good reflection for the business. <laughs> no, no yes. not at all. Yes. Kid was young, sorry, and dumb in this case. But be aware of that. That's yeah. something that can happen. It yeah. can affect you Absolutely. dramatically. Also, it can put you in a, a legal pinch if Absolutely they right. yeah. disclose information. Um, audit your business. Run a pen test. Talk to an IT consultant. Make sure that you have most of your teeth and eyes checked out, right? You don't know what you don't know when you don't know what to ask, mm -hmm. right? One thing we see with the with client is like, okay, I have this. And then we ask a bunch of questions. Like our intake form is like almost 70 questions. Have a backup. How do you do this and this? And I'm like, I never thought about it. Do you have this policy when you lay off someone? You fire someone from your business. Like how fast do you close the account? They just like, okay, close the emails. What about their access to this platform, this platform? So do you have any way to track what access and platform you give them access to? Do they have their own cell phone? How do you track that they don't siphon the data out, right? There is a lot of way to track this information. Mm -hmm. Being aware of that is critical. Great advice. Yeah. That's great. Well, Galico, thank you for coming on our show. The way that we like to land the plane, the last question that we <laughs> ask is, if you could go back in time to any point in history and offer yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Maybe be an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just different. Uh, probably I would enter a cybersecurity field a little bit earlier in mm. this case. Uh, yeah. I mean, late to the party. Being an MSP, uh, well, I want to say it, it, it does give you a lot of power. We are like jack of all trade, but master of none. We know so much stuff, but we don't specify or specialize in one specific thing. So sometimes I just miss like, I want to know more about this industry. But running a business... I need to know about everything from software, computers, hardware, cloud, cybersecurity, breach security, data analysis. I know a lot, but I'm not specific in one thing. So this is why we hire other people to help us for specific things. But mm -hmm. definitely getting into, getting into cybersecurity is a great start for mm -hmm. a business. Yeah. Where can our audience find out more about you and your company? <clears throat> uh, social media, we're on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Apollo IT Services. Uh, and of course, our website, fullitservices.com. We are in NWA in Texas. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. I had a Enjoyed blast. it. Uh, yeah, it was you. great. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors. If you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.